honor and a great pleasure to introduce uh, Yoko Tawada uh, and Lex Lemaker uh, to you today. Yoko Tawada, for me, is one of the most interesting authors writing in the world today. Uh, and as you know from the uh, program, uh, she has been living for some uh, time in, in Berlin, writes uh, her many books equally in German or in Japanese. She's talked about how different it is to write in those two languages. Uh, and she's a great uh, writer who thinks very deeply about both being local uh, in these different places, and being global, thinking about the languages, the scripts, what disappears as Japanese crosses the Pacific or as German crosses the Atlantic, she talks about. Uh, uh, often writing about the, the exhibition belt or between worlds uh, that she's often in. This is one example of, uh, of the subtlety of, of her work on issues of translation and cultural translation. Uh, one of my favorite of her dozens of books, the ones I've been reading in German, uh, is Übes Zetsonen, a fantastic work, uh, which sounds like the word for translation in German, Übes Zetsonen. But if you look, you see, instead of a T in the middle of two E's, Übersetzungen, which means either overseas tongues, Übersetzungen, or possibly Übersetzungen, or possibly about Zetzungen, which is a kind of fish. Uh, so three different meanings at, at once. Her heroine here, who may or may not be a Petwala herself, uh, is, is oscillating between uh, Germany, Japan, particularly the uh, MIT uh, in, in Cambridge and also in South Africa, where she starts to learn Afrikaans, uh, all these sort of lost and vanished and newfound uh, cultures. So, quite an extraordinary uh, writer altogether. Just one quote from an essay of hers on literary exiles. Uh, she wrote, uh, I am, to a, am astride two languages and cultures. Exile is an immense force for liberation, for extra distance, for automatically developing contrasting structures in one's head not just syntactic and lexical, but social and psychological. It is, in other words, undoubtedly leaping forth, but there is a price to pay. The distance can become too great. The loss of identity as writer in the alien society can be burdensome. The new language can feel more and more remote. So one has to fight all that as an extra effort, though that effort can also result in escaping the familiar phrase, the expected word, uh, simply because it no longer comes into one's head. So even here, there is an advantage. Uh, we have a double advantage here uh, that uh, our master sermon is with Doug Slaymacher at the University of Texas, who is one of the great uh, Tawada experts, uh, pro uh, proponents, who has edited a collection of essays, critical essays on her work, and continues to do more work today. So I'm delighted to present to you Yoko Tawada. in my music lessons to be able to understand the notes. Most of these words had to do with speed, accelerando, or volume, pianissimo. There are even some, some that indicated an emotion, for example, piangendo, lamenting, or crisp, sad. Maybe I could find enough words in a dictionary of musical terms to cover all the emotions in my text. I like the idea of speaking about feelings in a language I'd never learned. Feelings speak a different language than we do. 
feelings cannot be arti artificially produced, but they can be artistically represented by changing the tempo and volume. It's good to be able to speak a language, but not being able to speak a language ought to have advantages as well. In the 12th century Japan, when overripe court culture was beginning to rot in its own bittersweet perfume, and it became necessary to abandon the main stage of politics to the professional fighters, the samurais, a new sort of dance arose that was known as shirabiyoshi. The representative of this new dance were women dressed as men with a sword at the hip. Perhaps it was a leftover of the shamanic tradition in which a change of gender was understood as a sign that the person in question had come in contact with the god. The tra tra transition from the old rituals to dance was fluid, so shirabiyoshi was not a religious dance. At that time, the Japanese capital, Kyoto, was home to two sisters, Kyo and Inyo, who were celebrated as young, trans talented Shirabiyoshi dancers. The older sister, Ryo, soon became the concub concubine of Kiyomori, the most powerful samurai of the day, who saw dance as an independent subtle part of life. Thanks to her older sister, the younger sister, Inyo, also enjoyed great repute among her colleagues. So at, ta at times, it was mixed with cold, wet envy. Kiyomori provided Kyo with a villa in Kyoto so that her family could live there. So she herself spent most of her time with him at his residence. Her mother, who had eaten bitter rice long enough after the death of her husband, rejoiced at the carefree life she was able to lead in the elegant villa. Each month, the family received 180,000 liter of rice and a heap of gold coins. Taira no Kiyomori, omoomoshiku, maestoso, imperioso, ユダイナソラ、グランディオーソ。四つの海を支配し、怖いものなし one day, another dancer appeared in the capital, attracting all the city dwellers' attention. She was 16 years old, came from the Kada region, and was called Hotoke. You couldn't tell if it was her talent or her youthful beauty beauty that made her whole being so radiant. She loved herself because her real audience loved her. Even the wind always blew in a way that favored her, so she had not yet experienced a single defeat. One day she thought, I have made a name for myself as a shirabiyoshi dancer. But Kiyomori, the most powerful man of our time, has not once invited me to perform for him. Today, I shall invite myself to his home in accordance with street artist customs. Otoke set out of Nishihachijo, where Kiyomori had his residence. とは言うものの、まだ清盛様の前に踊ったことがない。お呼びがないなら、こちらからお仕掛けましょう。
When Kiyomori uh, there was a dancer who, she stood, who wanted to see him and that she was already standing at the gate, he was seized with fury. Someone who enjoys too much power as he did can easily be taken aback. He said to his concubine, Gyo, whom he had come to Christ not only as a dancer, but also as a conversation partner and advisor. This girl has invited herself to my home. What outrageous impertinence. Artists should appear only when I send for them. Besides, all dancers are going compared to you. Send the conceited creature home. She should consider herself fortunate to be sent away without punishment. Meanwhile, Otoke had crept into the courtyard and was listening at the door. Kiyomori's heart, heart was injured or cried. She wanted to leave, but then overheard the words Kyo was saying to Kiyomori. I know the customs of the street artists. They visit the court without an invitation to show their art. They are free in their behavior, and the only rule that governs them is that of gravity. Otoke is still very young and inexperienced. If she wants to visit you, this is because of her reverence for you, not out of contempt. You shouldn't punish her with poisoned words. Kiyomori,勝手に押しかけてきた仏の図図しさにイライラ怒りイライラ怒ってラッピア腹を立てるんだ器用が取りなす芸術家は呼ばれなくても芸を見せに来るものですしかもこの子は若くて純粋陰の剣って追い返す
だんだん早くマッチェルランドの優雅なグランディオーソそして華やかにグリーンランテン清盛は目が離せない仏を慈しむ心が芽生え燃え上がる火のようにコンフォーコ熱狂的にパッションなためにね。And so on. I read this、um, text also to Italy and some Italian people say there are words that they don't know. So I don't know. I picked them up from my Japanese dictionary of music terms. Okay. And the next text is this one. This is.、Uh, You don't have to understand it. It is a kind of visual art and express、um, um, feeling of mixed culture and transformation of letters. And yeah, as you know, we write Japanese, when we write Japanese, we mix. Japanese phonetic letters and Chinese ideographs. And to explain it to German people, I made this text. You know, if Germans would use, use、um, Chinese characters as Japanese, the German text can, could seem like this. And this is a gun, absolutely normal German text. But written not only by alphabet, but also by Chinese characters. And you can read it totally normal in German, I believe. Die Früchte des Mondes. Ich sank auf der Toilette, da kam der Mond herangerollt. Nackt auf einem Fahrrad. Er hatte den Weg mitten durch den Metaphernpark genommen, um mich zu treffen. Draußen die Straße entlang spazierte Zähneputzend eine schöne Frau. Auf der Bank im Park trank ein Mann in Umstandskleidung Apfelsaft. Am Ende eines Jahrhunderts ist die Gesundheit eben angesagt. Im Himmel klafft ein Loch, die mondgestaltige Angst, der mondgestaltige Kummer sind weg, alles Gestaltige flattert munter um das Loch herum. Die Falte des Abgrunds glättet sich. Auf der glatten Oberfläche der Sorge treten die Dichter aus Schlittschuhen am Mond meiner neben mir. <lacht> Maybe there are not many people who can read this text. You must know German and you must know Chinese characters. And if you are interested in the meaning of this poem, this is an English translation. I don't know if you have heard about the Southeast translation. It is an acoustic translation, and Ernst Jandl,、um, um, Vienna poet, did it very often. And he translated English poems into German, but not the meaning, but the、uh, um, sound of the language. And this is a, a poem by Wordsworth. Maybe you know that. And He just put the German words and it sounds like a kind of dialect of English. You know? my, my heart leaps, Satzen, I behold. We are then poor in the sky. So was sieht, wenn man läuft, begehen. So es sieht nahe immer mehr. So wird, wenn Erschel grollt. Urlech mit Ei. Sehr steil, dies Vater, Rosse, Mähne. Im Teig kurt Wisch, Mai, desto Bier. Baum, Deutsche, Deutsch. Bayonet, Schuhe, Alp, Eiertier. And I, I asked Google Translate to translate this 
German text into English. Yeah. I'm Doug Schleimaker, University of Kentucky. Um, I'm out of my league up here. <laughs> you, she threatened to make me read this, and I said I can't read it. It doesn't make sense. But it's too late now. Isn't it? <laughs> so, may hug, sweet ye hold. He's drilling in Lake Quay. So what does it? No, that's not right. What does see if May is going to commit? So it looks like MMOs. So if the ass rats hear it with egg, see this fattening steed mowing steeply, and no worms may be more beer. Cheery German, German bayonet shearing incubus egg animal. <laughs> so I did a similar thing between German and Japanese. And kotoba means was, and, and this poem is, and um, I, I, I wrote one poem in Japanese and translated it acoustically into German. And I need, can somebody read the German for me? Is somebody here who can speak German? Please come to me. ことばコートバー口の中からこっちの中から口の中から口の中から口の中から口の中から口の中から口の中から口の中から口の中から口の中から口の中から口の中から口の中から口の中から口の中から口の中から口の中から口の中から口の中から口の中から口の中から口の中
when you speak German, I asked. These questions are not easily answered. If a person were to acquire an additional personality when learning an additional language, someone who speaks five languages would possess five personalities. Should this person look like a country fair with five different booths? I don't have a single booth. I am similar to a web. The structure of a web gets denser when new traits are incorporated. In this way, a new pattern is formed. There are more and more knots, tight and loose spots, irregularities, uncooperated corners, edges, holes, or superimposed layers. This web, which can catch tiny plankton, I will call a multilingual web. So, can I ask you to come to me and ask me some questions? <laughs> Yes, yeah. you can. Okay. So this is Tawasan's idea that she'll read for a bit, you know, for 10 minutes or so, we'll have a conversation, she'll do some more reading, some more conversation, and we'll put some questions for everybody. Um, I think you're going to use that. A lot of what's going to happen is translations, uh, words, personalities, all these sorts of things, right? And I'm a big fan of the last thing you just read, the writing and the web of words, the web of relations, all the interconnectedness between words and languages and places. I think that's one reason there's so many masks in Tawada Yoko's writings. Uh, it makes me feel like a turkey. Because turkey in Japanese is a shichimento. It's a bird with seven faces, right? So it feels like it's got, if she's talking about being all these booths at a country fair, we've got all these different things. It seems like it ought to work. I don't know. I haven't seen it in her work yet. But I wanted to ask you about that sort of thing, right? Maybe it's just sort of the schizoid thing, the personality, and multifaceted the fast aspects of this. But can you say more about this, um, the, the personality and language and translation? I realize that wasn't a question. So. Okay, so Taki has seven faces. Yes. And I think I have even more. Because the face is, to me, not something that express my identity, but um, it is something between two persons. You know? My face does not belong to me. Because when I see someone who I hate, uh, my face closed, I cannot control it. Or well, I have too big respect, um, maybe my face become uh, uh, distorted or something. That is not my face. And this is a, um, the in-between place. And in Japan, or in Buddhism, there are many uh, canon figures who have many faces. It's not negative in the culture that you have many faces. But in the Christianity, the Jesus has never two faces, right? But who has, who has uh, many faces in the Christianity? Oh. Anybody know? Devils and dramas. Eh? Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's the genesis. That's what I think of the, the two faced. It, it wasn't covered. Yeah. So I'm also thinking faces and facets and dimensions or walls and this sort of thing too, right? Different ways that we can look out into the world. And some of your characters have that sort of thing going as well. Yeah. But it's not a mask, you know? The, sometimes people say Japanese people have a mask on the face. It's not my image of the face, but the face itself can change. It is not a mask, but the, the face shows many expressions. It depends on with whom you speak. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Can I ask you a different question? No, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to ask you, well, no, let me go back to the first one, Shinobi Oshi, which you, the first thing you read, which is one of my favorites, I love this work, and it's very funny, and it's funnier if you know some Japanese, but I was thinking about translation, going to different words, have you ever translated it into dance? You should dance Shinobi Oshi, have you ever done that? You know the Shinobi Oshi, put the sword on it, um, what do you think about that? I'm thinking about the uh, dancing poems and, and I just began to put the letters in 
like the dancers for choreography. Okay. So it will become the dancing poem for, uh, for my translation of the poems into dance. Perfect. That would be. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm thinking of the translation in not just from languages to languages, but words into mm -hmm. other characters or language or poems into dance, or a lot of what you do feels like sculpture almost, or in a lot of the imagery yeah, yeah, has yeah. words that say solid things that yeah, trip yeah. over. Yeah. yeah, because the language is, of course, not only the meaning, but it's a movement. The figures and it's uh, near to the dance, so I can imagine the language as a dance language. It is independent from any national language, but it's just a movement. Um, yeah. And visual, right? Um, Not just yeah, oral, but yeah. visual as well. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask a little more about the surface translation mm -hmm. thing, because I don't quite understand it totally yet, mm -hmm. but I find it hilarious. But I also want to know, are there, are there people in Japanese who've done this sort of thing? Or have that kind of, there must be, do you know who they are? So we were talking about earlier, uh, there's this writer, um, I don't know what his actual name is, his pen name is Edogawa Rampo, right? And if you know Japanese, it's supposed to sound like Edgar Allan Poe. That's who he's thinking about. So that's one that comes to mind. Do you know other people doing this in Japanese? Or, or do you think about it in the Japanese tradition when you're doing surface translation? Um, no, in, not in the history of of the literature, but maybe as a joke or to learn English. When Japanese people pronounce, I get off. Listen, I get to off. So no American understand it. But to pronounce it better, there is a again to off. Again to off. Fried tofu. No? And, but when we say a get tofu, it's a, the, the chance is better to be understood. How many people have heard that if you're going to learn the Japanese doi tashi mashite, you need to say, don't touch my mustache? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's a kind of surface transition. Yeah. I think there's surrealist poets who are doing this kind of thing as well that I was also thinking about. Um, so more about translation. How does translation work in your practice? I mean, you know, because you write in different languages. Yes, I, and I try to not to translate any text because translate it's not good the idea that the author translate his own own text. When I translate my own text, I uh, often have the I uh, I want to change the text. Because I think, ah, I wrote it in Japanese in this way, but in German I have to write in other way, other characters, other stories, so I can change everything. It's not no translation that destroy, destroy, uh, destroy the text. And so I write my German text in German and Japanese text in, in Japanese. And in English translation or in French, they come to can uh, they they can come together in one book, right? But often they come out at the same time. Like the German, yeah. German and Japanese, it looks like they're being written at the same time. Is that different? Is that not what's happening? Um, I don't know. I, 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 I'm always writing German text and Japanese text at the same time, but they are quite different. Yeah. But, they, but still, they have no connection. I think as author that they have no connection, but still they begin to uh, communicate each other. So there is always com um, communication, yeah, connection. Parallel. 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 It's no parallel word. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, they are crossing okay. without my, <laughs> my control. Yeah. 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 One more question. And I'll, I'll Here's some more from you. The, also in Shirabiyoshi, the first thing you said, you talked about uh, liking the idea of speaking and feeling in a language you've never learned. Now, can you say more about that? Speaking or thinking or dreaming or living maybe in languages you've never learned? I think each language is at the same time many languages. That means, uh, for example, in, in Japan, also in Europe, you say yogurt. 
and never think that this is a Turkish word. Right? So the culture is always mixed and the language is always mixed. And the not learned it means to make aware of that you are speaking the languages all the, always that you, you have never learned. Okay. Yeah. So we do it all the time. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Good. Thanks. Let's go on to the next one. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The character for person looks so sparse, no brain, no shoes to wear. If it just had hands, it could light a fire, but it cannot create light or warmth on its own. What can a person who does nothing to do stand on the sand and gaze at the sea like the white rabbit at Inaba, his skin might be turned off by a crocodile. He might be thrown on a pile of firewood to be burned at the stake. Society seeks an unending supply of human sacrifice. They say the energy released as a body burns is clean and natural. Does a character for person look like it is walking, or does it seem to stand transfixed? The character stretches straight up the length of its spine. At some point, it will strike the softness of the clouds. It shows the moment it thinks. There is no need to go any higher, and then people become trees. Plum trees with cropped spines and covered in bumps. They say plants are in mammalian forms. They make cultures of color and form from only light, water, and carbon dioxide. They do not eat unsensibly. That is the reason they can live. Without excreting or smelling west from the entrance. Instead of building houses, they give their own bodies as homes to the caterpillars, to the woodpeckers, to the squirrels. Water. If ascending to the heavens is the job of a pilot, then falling from the heavens is the job of an angel. Water too is a band of good angels that falls and falls from the stitches of the clouds. Stuck on the shoulder, they held them onto the wet mirror of the highway and smash into spray. The road collect the drops and becomes a rushing river, which eventually becomes a large serpent that twists and turns, covering away the shores of people's land, carrying earth and sand. It curves away, leaving the face on the earth in the Rice. A pair of stars fills her ball, the tips of the sharp ray of light sweetly sting the mouth of the ones who eat it. A refreshing breeze flows in behind their eyes. 
what looked like a spot on the whole wall is now seven mosquitoes, the hair of their legs clearly visible. They say eating star eyes allows one to see into the distance. 30 kilometers away, a small child is visible, nose bleeding, as it plays with a crack. Three years away, the window of an unmanned bank is visible, as it blows in the wind, banging open and shut. Dog. A single man squats on the precipice. His left hand grabs the head of his dog flat as a plate. He sticks out his right hand and lets it gently bite. He gazes at his palm, slick with saliva. Takes off the dog's collar, replaces it with a chain of flowers. Suddenly, he frames, embraces it, press his cheek against the dog's eye. The tears will up. He embraces the dog's head firmly with both arms and then pushes the dog into the bubbling river of the volcanoes below. Large. They say the character beauty means large sheep. They say the larger the living sacrifice, the less the misfortune. Even a small wind will soon blend the sparkles of a big umbrella. They say that in prison people die in the order of their height. Big people eat small people. Big countries hate small countries. Big mice respect small elephants. Sick. A time will come when dawn will melt into dusk. Worms will meet the same as cold. Walk slowly and the station will feel near. A single cracker will fill our, fill our stomachs. And at the moment one wants to stop writing, a poem appears on the page. It is still possible to speak now to those not yet dead. Inside my stomach are entrails I have still not touched. Someone I have not yet met consoles me for a crushing sorrow I have not yet felt. The language I use at the moment is one I have not yet started to learn. The poems I have not yet written are already written. I hope that the other creatures that I cannot yet imagine that will inhabit the earth far into the future will be far happier than us. End. At the end of the sleeve is a sensitive hand. At the end of the hem is a delicate yet strong ankle. At the end of the foot is breath. I rise one foot like a crane. I spread out my left hand holding a fan like a wing and I transform from woman into a bird, from bird to a letter. Come. I do not know where you stand. Is it the place where I once stood long ago? I hear a voice calling me, but I want to return only to places I have never been. This is not Chinese character. <laughs>
Can I ask you? Can I say no? <laughs> no, you cannot say no. <laughs> Yes, sir. On Tuesdays, I like to eat my father. He tastes of medicine. Red dough is what he's made of. I know he's really a woman, but you can't say this to his face or his eyes will turn off. When the fire is hot and the sun is down, his dead brother is in his ear. Otherwise, I'll have to keep eating the whole thing in the belly until I reach it. I stand in the dark and ask God to bring me to the earth. I'm going to hear two words in the Bible. I'm not hungry. I don't have it. 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 I it is my father. I have no gun. He gets to go and fall. A fatal bullet in his belly and his throat. I didn't do it. From his stomach, two bullets are out. Two bullets are out. And the third survives. There are some poets in Europe who write multilingual poetry. Um, for example, Heike Fiedler. She is a, she is a German living in the French-speaking French Switzerland, and um, she she. She is not just a multilingual poet, but her performance is about voices, body, and the spaces. And um, I also think when I do the collaboration with music, the language becomes automatically multilingual. It is natural to use uh, more languages. And this is a uh, one. An example, a poem by Heike Fiedler, and when she read it, it's very beautiful, it's like music. When I try it, it's just an exercise, you know? <laughs> not yet, not yet, not now, not here, not da, not nicht, noch am um, ich bin, noch hier, not yet, ich nicht, noch now, pa, pa, jetzt, pa, la, uh, and so on. So you must activate many places in your brain at the same time. Yeah. And this one is another, uh, Sia Rin come from Finland, uh, Swedish, Swedish um, speaking Finland and living in Berlin. And she reads also very beautifully, so I cannot do that, but I can show this. Sesi Nepa Yun Pip Sesi is is keen, Pip oder was ist kein Pfeife nicht, da fall ich drauf. Pip oder nicht, Pip upa, Pipe upa, Pipapo. <laughs> but most of them mix the European languages, and I, of course, inform them. I mix Japanese. Language, language, and also uh, letters. The word literature. The word, word, a word. I'm bored. A murder. I'm mad. When I speak, I'm not there. A word in its cage, arresting, arrested, spits a report about my crimes about my card. No word, only its shadow. 
in which I rest, my shadow disappears in it. Nothing is judged when I am silent. I am made of the same material as you, material time between one world and a sip of water, there Ooh. where the voice awakes in the flesh. You hear without ears a word liberated from its duty, a word written directly on the, on the eardrum. The drum falls soundless, voiced, a word I bought, a place I ought. I recognize that the world is made by only five letters, but there are 26 letters in alphabet. So the rest of the letters are bigger than the world. And the question is, do I really know the world literature? I tried to check alphabetically if I know the literature of the world. And I asked me, do I know any writer from Afghanistan? No. Any writer from Albania? No. Algeria? Maybe Camus, but he's dead. He died 1960 when I was born. And Andorra? No. Andorra? No. Argentina? No. Armenia, Australia, Kerry, but no, not more. And do I have authors from Austria? Yes. And some of them are dead, but most of them are living. I, and I have met them, and I read them, and I talked to them. Elfriede Zürda, Ilse Eichinger, Atze Artmann, Ingeborg Wachmann, Thomas Bernhardt, Hans Eichhorn, Leopold Federmeier, Franz Ogel, Barbara Frischmuth, Arno Geiger, Elfriede Gerstel, Helga Branschnik, Ansel Glück, Peter Handke, and so on. And I'm sure that I forget five or six authors. <laughs> so most of us know only one um, small part of the world, or two, or three maybe. But it, it is not the world. The last poem of this part is Hamlet, no sea. And now you are in Japan, and Japan is like the place where Hamlet once stand. Behind you there are mountains, and in front of you the ocean. You have no place. And the question is to be or not to be, but in this poem the question is to eat or not to eat the vegetables from Fukushima. <laughs> to be, 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 to to be, to be, to to be, 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 to 食えたら食ってあげたい。召し上がってくれよ。食べるな。ない。ない。ないんだ。食え、食え、クエスチョン。食べられるのか。福島のトマト。福島のキャベツ。福島の大根ですと書いてある。八百屋の間近辺で。食
自然には還元されないショック耳を澄まして聞き取れる言語だけでも波の間から集めて書き留めて「to die to sleep」眠らないで「クエンクエンクエスチョンオブシシシェイクスピア」So especially at a time like this, the readings you're doing today, it's like Tawada Yoko's world has these words that like, they must be piled thick with stuff all over the place. Like, the words are blocks or something. Do you feel like you trip over words or things? Or are they like, like that in your world? What do you think? I think nothing. <laughs> okay. Because I'm thinking in terms of, of poems as sculpture, I'm still going back to this, uh, taking words as overly literal, the, the, when you did the characters earlier, pulling them apart, almost taking them too literally, literally working on them out that way, and the ways the words is, again, sculpture or as concrete things. A lot of your works have literally characters who are tripping over words as though they were bricks in the road or tongues that are in the way of things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because uh, literature is also the art, visual art, and also the music. So they are the surface, surface of the literature, the sound and the letters. And they are also in normal novels, they, they are very important, I think. But in these poems, I want to present the, this face, the surface of the literature. And as even if you don't understand the language, there are possibility to have um, access to, to them. But this is also if you when if you even if you understand the meaning, it is still important, and you don't have to forget that sculpture of the. So maybe that's why I'm stuck in this idea of language yeah. is sculpture. It's the, yeah. Or it's another kind of translation. Even if I don't understand yeah. the words, I can follow it as a music or rhythm or something like that. So that's yeah. going to be part of it. Yes, because the language is also not in the paper or in the, the author, but in the brain of the reader. You know? And it is, you must realize it in your brain or make the images or sound or something. You, you, you must create something in your brain without there is no, no literature. Does each person have their own world of literature? Each person has their own language, right? We were talking, mm. thinking about that earlier. There's almost as many languages as people thinking about the world of literature piece. Almost a sense if we all went through and did our own list, we each have our own world of literature? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There is no big world literature, but, uh, but each of us has some literatures and it is important that you have more, a two or more. But even one literature, one national literature has many literatures in it, so maybe one literature is enough to have one literature. And hundred literatures are not, not enough to, yeah. to talk about so one literature. So one is our problem. It's not everything yeah. to our one, stuff, <laughs> so that's our problem. Not multiple things. Makes sense. Um, another comment about the Harlem Sea that's interesting to me is doing these kinds of poems, yeah. poetry, borrowing lines from other places, makes me think of our friend uh, Suga Kejiro, who wrote a whole poem, All of Lines from Desai Osama, for example, mm -hmm. where you're taking them out and, and constructing things this way and moving it around and putting the, the works together in different ways. Mm -hmm. How does that process work? You start with sounds, you start with an idea, you start with um, in this case, I was in, in Victoria in Canada, the end of 2011, I think, and I wanted to write about Fukushima, a poem, and read it, but nobody understood Japanese. Nobody is not true. There are some, some people of Japanese studies, but, but still I wanted to create my poem in, in dialogue with some English-speaking uh, writer. And it was Shakespeare. He didn't know that. 
that I contacted him. <laughs> but it's a dialogue, a kind of conversation with another writer, you know? And I, I, put, I, I took his sentences and, and changed them, or eat them, or not eat them. <laughs> Um, and, and, and made this um, text that is uh, some Japanese words, kue, for example, me, uh, means uh, eat, but, but it, it um, continues to the, to the English word, question, you know, the kue, because the eat or not eat is a question, so kue and question, it is not an academic connection <laughs> between to to us, but, but um, I, 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 I was looking for my personal um, connection to, to the words that, um, that were there's, there. Yeah. There's also an interesting play on register in that, because kue is not the way we usually politely say, eat something, right? Mm -hmm. In contrast to the question and all the other things that are going yeah. on, there's a real, something powerful about that. Yes, yeah, yeah. So then I have another question, or another kind of question, because you write in Japanese and in German, perform in English. What do what do some of these what does German do better than Japanese? Or what does Japanese do that you can't do in German? Or what kind of things are you, can you do in one language you can't do in another? What do better? Um yeah. Um, I don't think that one language can sound better than another language, but when I write in German, all German words are used by German writers, so I'm in context of that history of German languages. Also, very simple words like Zeug, for example. Zeug is a, means a stuff, and Spielzeug is a children's toy. A nezoic is a sewing kit, you know? But very important word, zoic. But it is also the term that is uh, important for Heidegger, mm -hmm. and also zoic, zoic and zoic, Benjamin. So you are in context of all these Japanese, uh, German histories, but you, can, you are not um, alone, you know? That's a fascinating thing. If you write German, you have the direct contact with all authors who wrote in German. And the Japanese, I cannot compare Japanese with other languages because it is my mother tongue. That means Japanese is to me like the body, and all ideas, even the German ideas, come from my Japanese language, maybe, and go back to the Japanese language. But uh, the new ideas I got in the German language or English come back to, to uh, my Japanese language and change my Japanese language. So it is like a basement station, the Japanese language. And I can do many things with that language too, but the important thing is that I have that place. That's interesting, because I, I guess there's a question I've been asking, actually, because I don't know German, but I have this sense that the German writers are behind you and pushing on you and you're pulling from them and in conversation with them, but I don't get the same sense in, in Japanese. I know who the German, I have a sense of German writers that you are interested in and pulling from and done similar kind of projects. Well, are there Japanese writers who are doing these kind of word projects or things that you think about? Or? whose writing styles have influenced your writing in Japanese? Um, for example, Jinichiro Tanizaki, I don't write like he, but, but his idea of he, he read many European literatures, right? And think about the grammar and the language of European literatures, and then came back to Japanese literature or language, and to make the sentences that is very Japanese, but it's a uh, fake. And also, he also wrote in the um, East Japanese, uh, um, Kansai, 
We are Kansai dialect style, we are like in Kyoto, Osaka, mostly Osaka, but he was not born in Osaka, he just imitated it. And so his idea of, his idea of not looking for the roots, but studying something foreign to create the fake own culture. That that That's my tiny idea. Almost a different kind yeah, of language. Yeah. So. Okay, yeah. good. Let's do the next reading. Okay, the last reading. You have the English translation, but also, Japanese original is not to understand, so don't care if you don't understand the English translation. Jinshin Jiko. De, de, den, de, den, 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 ya, ya, de, den, sha ga tomarimasu. Jinshin Jiko. Ninshin Jiko. Oriru toki ni wa. おろすときには人心、人心の缶詰のように並んだ線路に沿ってゴロゴロ並んだ2心の死体死体、死たくない、あれ死たくない、これもう死たくない死体の死たくないよ心配事さえない心身の健康、精神の健康を宿る精子
The cassette recorder had no mouth, so you couldn't see how it was producing the one or the other sound. Even today, the term native speaker makes me think not of a person, but of a cassette recorder. <laughs> Many years later, I had the opportunity to observe a person speaking English more closely. I then realized that to speak English, it was necessary to open one's mouth, not just vertically, but horizontally as well. When I first arrived in Germany at 22, I was surprised to find that in every major city, nearly every evening, there was a poet willing to read his poems to an audience. In Japan, poetry readings are rare. I found it just as surprising that on German television, the samurais in Kurosawa's movie spoke German fluently. <laughs> As did the figures in anime films, even Lieutenant Colombo, who on Japanese television had spoken only Japanese, now spoke German as if he'd done so all his life. Also, the Lieutenant's face remained, rem remained the same as, as ever. I had the impression he'd now become another person. I was just as surprised to hear a friend of mine suddenly speaking a different language. Usually, my image of people were based on their voices, their choice of words, and the little pauses between words that made up the rhythm of their speech. But when you speak a different language, both your voice and your speech rhythm differ as well. I wondered whether I really knew this woman were just a cassette tape inside her. Can the body be compared to a cassette recorder in which you can keep changing the cassette? When I was a little, when I was little, one of my playmates showed me a doll that could talk. When the doll was undressed, you could see two little doors in its back. One of them concealed a battery and the other, a tiny cassette containing a recording of the doll's voice. The word to da is fukikae in Japanese. Fuki means to blow and kae to exchange. A different voice is blown into a body and replaces the old one. Dabbing is a shamanic activity. If, for example, a person wishes to speak with his dead mother, he goes to a shaman who summoned the souls of the dead. The soul of the dead woman enters into the shaman's body and speaks through his mouth. Like a film actor, he lets himself be dubbed. When I hear a poetry reading, I think about dubbing and shamanism. To begin with, we have the body of the poet. We have his voice through which we are hearing the poem. And then there is this poem as written text. But what do these three things have to do with one another? When you watch a dubbed movie, you should theoretically be able to notice discrepancy between the lip movements and the voice if you look closely enough. This thought has troubled me for a long time. Like a woman possessed, I stare at the actor's lips, waiting to discover moments where the dubbing does not work. Sometimes I find myself so preoccupied I miss the plot of the movie. What I am hoping to see is a pair of lips standing still while I am hearing the word, while lips last the emotion producing inaudible sentences. But dubbing techniques nowadays are so sophisticated, it's practically impossible to find an error. Film and television actors express themselves fluently in languages they don't speak, as if there are no such thing as a language barrier, no division between their voices and bodies. One day, I saw an installation 
that one once more drew my attention to the dubbing process. Unfortunately, I forgot the artist's name and have been unable to find him on the internet. This was at Art Basel, the international art show held in Basel once a year. A drive-in theatre had been set up outside the exhibition centre, and on the large screen I saw two cowboys dismounting from their horses and chatting with the reins in their hands. Just a scene from some western, who cares, I thought. You couldn't hear the sound, but even a person like me, who has never seen a western from beginning to end, could easily imagine the sorts of things they were saying. An empty car was parked in front of the screen, and when you got inside and put on headphones, you could hear the cowboy's voices. And what a surprise, the film had been dubbed with philosophical text. A writer who was there with me sh shouted in delight, it's Heidegger. <laughs> the work was perfect, there was no apparent discrepancy between the text and the movement of the cowboy slips. It's quite possible, in other words, to take a voice from some far off location and arbitrarily place it in the body of a film actor. To whom does a voice belong? The voice erases the question of who. On the other hand, the voices, voice is often used in demo, democratic society as a metaphor for a person's authentic opinion. You speak of people being given a voice when you, have, you are able to assert their political will. And in some languages, such as German, a vote is literally called a voice. When I hear poetry reading, it only strengthens my impression that the voice is coming from far away or from a person not literally present. You stare at the poet's lips to reassure yourself that you really do have before your eyes the authentic source of the poem. But the more closely you watch poet's lips, the more difficult it is to say where the sound of a poem comes from. So the world literature, the question is, is it include animals or not? Or is it a chikyumunga, the earth literature? And I wrote a book about polar bears and I quote something that the polar bears are saying about the national borders. For polar bears, national identity has always been a foreign concept. It's common for them to get pregnant in Greenland, give birth in Canada, they raise the children in the Soviet Union. They possess, possess no nationality, no passport. They never go into exile and cross national borders without a visa. The next poem is called a Chinese dictionary. Because we use also Chinese characters, I can, we can, we, that means Japanese people can understand each letter of them, but we don't express this word in this way, in this combination. So it is quite interesting to, to translate each letter literally. A Chinese dictionary. A panda bear is known as a big bear cat in Chinese. Sea lion, sea leopard, junior pig, pig mouse, dolphin, pig of the sea. <laughs> inkfish is inkfish. <laughs> Computer, 
electric plane. Cinema Institute for Electric Shadows. <laughs> Vertiginous in the eyes, innumerable flowers bloom in all their splendor. Faint, twilight of the past. The last poem is called Krofne. After over 200 years in Japan, the isolation of Japan, American ships came to Japan. Four black ships, Krofne. So Kuro means black, Krofne, black ships. Kuru means come. The people were very afraid of the world. They, have only, they had to open them to the world, but also very excited. So that this visual and sound poem express that feeling. You don't need the translation. Do you see four ships or not? Yes, the last one is a little bit flat, but... So I read from this. Muna, 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 grushi. ムナムナ苦しい村の中にムナムナ苦しい村の中に群れるムナムナ苦しい村の中に群れる群れがムナムナ苦しい村の中に群れる群れが群れて黒黒船黒船が来る黒船が来る黒船が来る来る黒船が
read the, the present more precisely and intensely so that uh, we can create some more images than the reality. And my uh, writing has changed in some way. Yes, I think so too. Yeah. Yeah? In what, yeah, but I would say dystopian or darker or heavier. Or no, no, it's not darker. <laughs> no, it's not darker because if you really have a problem, political problem or social problem, you cannot be just stay sad. You don't have uh, energy. You must, you must um, put your brain in full of energy. So you need you. You need the um, power of the language, and it is connected to joyfulness than, than sadness. Well, there's, still, yeah. Yeah, there, yeah. there's a lot of fun in a lot of the topsy-turvy world sorts of things in these books that are part of it. Yeah, yeah. I had the feeling that we must create new words, or we, we must discover old words to, to understand better the, the situation now. Yeah. But should we open it to the... Audience yeah, questions. Yeah, yeah. I think that how does this work? There are people have questions. I think there are okay, there are microphones spread around. Question? Thank you very much for your amazing talk. Um, I want to push uh, what you have just um, like in the beginning of your question mentioned um, like how does it feel to speak a language that you do not actually speak mm -hmm. so i want to invite you to, co to comment on that a little bit maybe um, for example uh, in one another interview you mentioned that dutch feels like a dream language for you because yeah. you speak german yeah and then in this talk you mentioned again how you use italian sounds so maybe you can give more examples, like how you relate to different languages as a writer and how does it uh, link to your creativity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You know, the dream language is a language that you have the feeling you could, you could understand it, but you cannot. But it is a language, so it is, to me, like a language free from the certain meanings. It's just a language pure. I really li love that image of dream language. And Afrikaans was similar to, to this dream language in South Africa. Because I could understand the literal, because of South Afrikaans is connected to Dutch, and Dutch is like German a little bit. And so, but yeah, I, I couldn't really understand. And that kind of dream language always interested me, and it comes again and again in my text. I think also you mentioned the Italian language that I cannot understand. But when I when I'm in Italy, I have the feeling, of course, I understand it. And if you listen to the Japanese language. Japanese poems, maybe something, you can understand something, not the meaning, but but something that the language does in, in its movement or sounds or the a kind of, yeah, movement, dance, the, the dance of the language, not the content. So is it because that, um, so is it because that you don't really speak it, so it's, mm, it has more potential for you to escape meaning yes. and mm. to play with it. Mm. But does it also uh, influence your relation to Japanese in a sense? Yes, way? yes, 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 of course. Because I often read Japanese in a country where nobody understands Japanese. So Japanese become to me also like a dream language that I cannot understand. I must read it as if I could not understand it. Thanks. There was another question in the back. Uh, thank you for opening up uh, reading and talk. And um, like you, I also moved to, to Germany from China to Germany mm -hmm. when I was 22 years old. And I've been there for three years. But until now, I can't 
read and write and speak journal um, like a native speaker. Um, I have a German friend who's a big fan of you, and she always correct uh, has always credited uh, the grammar mistakes in my German essays. And I ever asked her that when you read Yuvatawada's book, can you recognize that this book was written by a person whose uh, mother language is not German? She said no. And I asked her, and I asked her um, uh, when can I write German text like her? And she answered me, uh, when you live in Germany as long as her. So my question is, does the time really matter when you master a language and really write literary a text uh, with this foreign language like a native speaker? And is, is it even necessary to write uh, in a foreign language like, uh, like a native speaker? Mm -hmm. yeah. But the uh, foreignness has also many faces, you know. The, the German language that is written by foreigners can be very foreign in one way or another way, or it is, seems very native, but still, if you look closer, there are something that is coming from somewhere else. So, of course, I'm now in. I, I've been in Germany so long that the German, I cannot say that the German language is um, is very foreign to me. But the, still, the, I'm not uh, the scientist about the brain, so it's just a metaphor. Yeah? But the Japanese language is uh, um, take the place in another place in my brain, like the German place. It is not, you cannot never reach this place um, again, because I'm not a child. This is uh, all, only, only um, possible if you are a child. And this is uh, the mother tongue for me. And German uh, remains uh, always here in another place. But it is still a very creative process to to change between two languages. To me, it is the most important thing is that you have two or more places in your brain that you can you can move. If you have only one point, you are stuck. Right. Yeah. Right. Do you have your Japanese place? Yes. Where is it? Is, what is a native speaker? Is there such a thing as a native speaker that never makes mistakes in their own language? <laughs> yeah, native speaker is... Okay, so, uh, so, yeah, so I, I wanted to show this to N is English and with E is German. And this is Chinese plus Wari is Japanese. <laughs> yes, there's a question from here. Hello? Hi. Uh, thank you so much for your very great evening and your very great sessions. And this is my first time in the same to see English, so it's been really fun. Um, so I guess maybe this kind of goes away from just your own work into like bigger problems, but um, I've been teaching in the U.S., teaching Japanese literature and popular culture for a few years, and um, just, uh, you know, with Trump and everything, um, I think it's a very special time there. Um, where, you know, I keep on thinking about how as a sort of literary studies scholar what I can do. Um, but I wonder because you work so much with language and difference, um, and you were talking especially about, um, you know, post 3 11 and what you feel like you can do. So when you come back to Japan sometimes and you see problems here, um, are there specific things in everyday life that strike you as, you know, um, for example, like issues Japanese society has with accepting different types of people and that sort of thing that you sort of want to comment upon or um, is there something more that you want from Japanese literature uh, in general or something that you would say to up and coming sort of Japanese writers? I don't know if that makes sense. Can you streamline your question? <laughs> <laughs> um, do you mean that when I come to Japan 
three times a year, mostly, and I see the Japanese society is very difficult different from the European or German society and is that difference inspired me to write in literature or that's not the question. No? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think because as someone who goes back and forth between the US and Japan and other parts of East Asia a lot, I sort of have I feel like I can relate to some extent in terms of experiencing problems in different languages um, and seeing things in society that I want to change. And when you were talking about it being post-311 and um, feeling that literature should do something else, um, I guess to narrow down my question, is there something more that you think Japanese literature should be trying to do to um, work with different problems of difference in Japanese society right now? Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Do you think that Japanese contemporary literature do not write enough about the problem of Japanese society? Is it? Say here. Societal, oh. societal issues, it sounds like. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was thinking specifically of problems of difference in terms of um, like race for example, or working with different languages and that sort of thing. So not saying that doesn't happen at all, but from your pers from your sort of unique perspective, is there um, something more that you would like to see? I <laughs> think <laughs> There are so many writers in Japan, and I'm also in the jury of the young writers and for old writers too. So there are no Japanese problems that I have never read in the Japanese literature. But it does not mean that the people are discussing about these um, problems enough in the in the community or at school or somewhere else. So the literature is good enough, but the rest of the society is not. <laughs> good, let's move on to some other, there's the sea hands. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, so I've worked in the past with the uh, German-Russian writer Olga Martinova. Do you know Olga? No? <laughs> I don't know, she works between German and Russian, so she writes prose mostly in German and then poetry in Russian and lives in Berlin now. Uh, but when she also writes uh, her novels and, and poetry, they also often take on these sort of strange forms. She works with uh, sort of concrete poetry designs within the text. And then, you know, the fact that there, there are these sort of similarities uh, between two writers writing in German, but also between German and, and a different language. Do you find that contemporary German literature is a good space for this sort of experimentation with language? Is there something in the water in Germany right now that uh, is sort of fostering this sort of um, play with language, play between languages, and with the form of language itself? I think there are many interesting poets in German-speaking countries, especially in Austria, but the problem is they are playing with words and they are isolated from the society. The society become more and more conservative and they play more radically. And that's a, so if I have reading in Austria, I have always good audience, but they are not normal people. <laughs> They are always coming to the readings and they are always thinking about the art, literature, poetry, but they cannot change the society. The society became worse and worse. Um, thank you for this beautiful um, presentation. Uh, I think uh, it's my fourth time to see you live. 
Um, so like I, I yes, we were in contact recently. Uh, my name is Monika Tomas and I'm from Romania. And I just contacted about the um, uh, memoirs of Polar Blair, the translation. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, so um, what is the, uh, this problematic of uh, uh, face and voice? Um, so you have uh, that short novel called Persona, um, where a Japanese um, young woman uh, who lives in Germany at, at the end of the novel will like, place a uh, no mask on her face. And, like, and um, also in Verbandungan you wrote that uh, um, the, the views, like the, the gays um, uh, people, of foreigners, would uh, somehow inscribe a uh, face on your face as a foreigner in another uh, country. But so like, I felt like that there is a, a certain fear um, because of looking um, differently. But at the same time, um, it, yeah, yes. It. So. Um, at the same time, in your um, writings, uh, language uh, and the voice, the sounds that, that humans produce, they give freedom. So how do you think about this? Like on one side, there is no freedom because of how we look like, but on the other side, there is this freedom of sounds, of languages, even like we might understand them or not. If we do, we can make like parallels and play with words. Yeah. I think the freedom does not mean you can control it. No, the freedom is, um, I don't know what it is, but the one image that's very important to me is that in the no theater, in Japanese traditional no theater, you know, the actor puts a mask on the face and it means the soul of the dead people come to, to this actor and he speak, his body speak, the voice of the death. So it's not authentic voice of the actor or the author, but the, the mask, put, to put on the mask means that you, you are um, ready to speak as someone else. And that is sometimes what the literature do, does. You, are, you have the narrator or other characters and they are not the author himself, but you speak the, as someone else. I think mine is kind of a follow-up question. First, I just wanted to thank you for the wonderful performance. Um, but also, I think I wanted to ask about voice and, and sort of across genres and media. <laughs> Do you conceptualize a different relationship to voice, say when you're writing a novel in, in characters versus the narrator, or for perhaps when you write a poem, is it your own voice? Do you create a character for the voice? Do you have different yeah, yeah. relationships? Yeah. But you could just speak to that. Okay. Can, can you make a comment about the yeah. different voices? Yeah. yeah. Different voices, yeah. The voices are. Uh, You know, it is something that sounds very strong, some, something that represents one person, it seems to, but it's because it is always come somewhere else. Not only, but it, it, the, some voices come um, together in one voice, and the poet, especially the poet and um, poet's voice, is uh, the combination of many voices, voices from the history, from the past, and, and personal voice, and so on. But if you speak in, on the court, or the official, politically, you must, you are responsible for your voice, so, right? It is your personal responsibility. So you cannot say, ah, I said that, but that was another person who said that. That's a, Maybe a problem, but in the literature, this point that you cannot say that my voice is my voice, it makes the literature interesting. I've lost track of the <laughs> microphone. Yeah, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, as a follow-up, 
so your voice is not your voice. I was wondering whether your body is your body. I was thinking specifically of the short story uh, Saint George and the Translator, uh, in which uh, the translator uh, keeps postponing uh, the task of translating the text, and his body has a very uh, he has a very physical reaction to the task of translating. He gets so itchy. He has this uh, his bones in his skin. I was wondering whether you also had this kind of reaction when, uh, to translation. The body is, to me, a very sensible medium for everything that I do. It is, uh, you know, if you read the text and you want to translate it, the feeling that you have to that original text is, maybe if you um, trans express it in the language, you can just say, oh, it is interesting, I like it, I don't like it. It's very primitive. But the body, speaks much more. Maybe it is so you have the, on one hand you have a headache, but the other hand your hand is very happy. Or you have the feeling that you, are, you become hot, but you don't know why. But your food, feet are cold and so. The body is always made, made by many parts and they don't explain something, but you can feel so many feelings at the same time, also your feeling to the text. So it's um, very clever to translate with your body together, not only by your head. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, you were good, Mike, go ahead. Thank you very much for your talk. Thank you so much for the talk, and um, I have one curious question about readership because when you um, when you perform the reading of your poetry, since I speak Chinese, mm -hmm. German, and English, yeah. I had totally different experiences. And when it comes to Japanese, I have to consult my friend here because I don't speak Japanese at all. So here's my curious question. So I think you totally create a new type of world literature, but I think uh, well, my perspective is you're also kind of expecting or creating a new type of new world literature reader. So um, my question is, um, do you have any expected reader or like do you think of readers when you create your poetry? Because I think if you speak different languages, then reading your poetry is totally a different experience. Thank you. Thank you. In the 80s, I, I wrote just German text for German people and Japanese text for Japanese people. But then I began to move in the world and especially at the university in the United States, I recognized that there are many various people. Some of them understand Japanese but not German, and others understand German and English. And that there are many people who understand only English, but so you can never um, write for one readership. But the text itself must have um, the energy that uh, is all of you can access to that. But also, even if you don't understand the meaning, and. The good thing was also after the reading, they, the audience began to, to talk each other because, hey, you understand Japanese, what does it mean? And that, just like you did. And also, in, and then I thought, also in the um, monolingual writing, in monocultural country, you cannot say that everyone understands the same. You know, each of you understand something else. And there are always holes, uh, black, black holes or some white spaces in the literature that you, you can never really understand. Only even in your mother's hand. So that's the nature of the literature, that each of you understand something else and nobody can understand everything. And that's why I um, present this kind of readings in the mixed international yeah, occasion for audience.
Maybe one or two more questions? <laughs> Sorry, it's an important presentation. Um, you say um, you, you want to create, uh, make new work for, uh, for understanding 311. Yeah. So, maybe it's a very sensitive question. Uh, however, and what do you mean uh, understanding for you? Mm. Yeah, that's a very good question. <laughs> It's not enough time. <laughs> yeah, but I think you know there are many questions about um, March 11, right? Why do people accept such thing like nuclear station? Well, why? Don't we know in Tokyo that our electric energy are produced here? Why didn't we know that in Tokyo? Well, why there are so many differences of the um, reception of that nuclear between Japan and Europe and the United States? And what does it mean? And so, so many questions. And if you use only sentences that you usually use in your everyday life, it is not enough. You need new ideas and a new um, aspect or a way of thinking and so on. That, and so I meant not only a new words, but also the new sentences or new argument figure of writing or a new style, new form of discussing and thinking and so on. 